employees in this safety culture mindset. And safety culture really does save money because really you're investing in your employees. That employee is going to feel more valued, more cared about. They're going to feel and actually be safer. And the, here's a the really great thing about I, they get to take this with them. So a lot of times... Welcome to another episode of the Business Blind Spots Exposed podcast. I'll call it Blind Spots because it's a lot shorter. Uh, let me tell you, first of all, what the Blind Spots uh, podcast is all about. For me, uh, there are the things that I know. There's the stuff that I know I don't know. And there's all the other stuff that I have no clue about. That's the stuff that comes and hurts you. As a business owner, as one who's worked and led companies and worked for companies, it's the stuff that you don't know that you don't know really can come and bite you in the backside. So as an individual, as a person, as a professional, I've always tried to find increase my perspective, increase what I could see through others people, other people's eyes. And that's the purpose of this podcast, to help you see some of the stuff that I can also see when talking to our guests, experts, coaches, uh, industry veterans who can share a perspective that you may not be able to see by yourself. So Chime in, uh, comment, put in the comments just where you're, uh, where you're connecting from. Would love to hear from you. And I've got a fantastic guest today, Jerry McCormick. Hey, Jerry, how you doing? Real well. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. So I want to do a little bit of housekeeping here, but I also want to tell you a little about Jerry and why I've got him on the podcast today. I think there's a lot we can learn here about safety and safety cultures. But today I've got Jerry McCormick, who's, who's sitting here with me already. A culture of safety and the data behind safety. Uh, Jerry, I want to tell people a little bit about your background because, gosh, when, you know, when you first told me a little bit about who you were and what you've done, I was like, gosh, this is the guy I need to listen more to. When, when I think I know safety, well, then, then I met Jerry. <laughs> so uh, the industry is consulting in workplace violence prevention and distracted driver training. So just a lot of stuff that's in and around companies today. Uh, he's a chief safety officer for the company Personal Safety at Work, uh, 30 years of experience as a police officer, eight years in the U.S. Marine Corps. Thanks for your service. Uh, personal safety expert has researched over 300 incidents of active shooter cases, developed training uh, for thousands of public safety professionals uh, on how to respond. Uh, gosh, you did... Uh, uh, employee personal safety training after interviewing 9,800 police officers in US, the US, Europe, China. Oh, all kinds of stuff here, Jerry. <laughs> all kinds of stuff here. Distracted driver training, turn, turnkey fleet safety management programs, uh, distracted driver accidents cost the insurance industry $60 billion a year is, an, uh, is a note that I wrote down, wrote down here. And you have ways to help them start to change their behaviors and their beliefs so that we can start to slowly chip away at that company by company. Yep. Um, I feel like I'm covering a lot of stuff there. Jerry, did I do a fair job of kind of covering sort of some of what you've done? I mean, there's a lot to what you've done in your, your career there. You know, Vinay, I've watched several of these podcasts, commented on several as well. It's um, You do such a good job with bringing your guests in and giving them an opportunity to share what they know about and really just help your audience and even yourself as you talk about it all the time, all the nuggets you take away. Yeah, you did a really good job. Uh, so I, I have a workplace prevention uh, program as well as a distracted driver turnkey program. We do a facility assessments. We can help with drills. But really, it's all about empowering um, companies, employees, in this safety culture mindset. And safety culture really does save money because really you're investing in your employees. That employee is going to feel more valued, more cared about. They're going to feel and actually be safer. And the, here's a really great thing about I, they get to take this with them. So a lot of times I'll go with a company and we'll track them for six or eight months after they've been trained. And we average 15 people per for 500 that we trained, that they they'll come back and tell the company, I was able to avoid being a victim of a crime following the training that Personal Safety at Work provided because we gave them the tools not only to recognize what it is as it's evolving, and so then what are the action steps and then how are you going to respond? Because really in the research, particularly interviewing the 9,800 plus police officers in America, Europe, and China, I really just haven't found one to be a victim of a crime. Your listeners can very easily check this by going to a friend and say, that's a police officer. Most people know somebody and ask them if they've ever been on a person-on-person -person crime. We're not talking about fraud on your credit card. 
And along the way, we found that there's six reasons why. And about 83% of the cops that I've interviewed don't know why they're not victims of crime. They usually say something like, I'm not a sucker, or I'm not gullible. But the reality of it is they get trained on how to recognize crime or, or things just developing, a fight called domestic littering, whatever. Where is it relative to where they're standing? If it's not, if it's right in the room with them, like right now I'm at Wheaton Academy in Chicago, Illinois, uh, working with uh, one of my business partners, Blue Point Alert System. They're a notification system. I've been trying to find somebody that really does it the right way because you and I've talked offline before. You need some kind of notification system. You need to practice it. And 99 times out of 100, it's not a violent incident. It's a medical call. But if you could, these guys, they do a great job of, they text notify when a, a pull station for a police or for an EMS is called. If they have a diagram pops up on the police phone. So they'll see it right away exactly where in the building it is. In this case, they're installing system in Wheaton Academy. I've come here to check out the install. But the great thing is, is we're doing something and you have to practice it. If you go to my website, personalsafetyatwork.com, I've got a couple of videos about this in enunciation of our notification, practicing notification system every quarter, every six months. And you do it in a powering, engaging way. It really does help um, help your employees feel more valued. And it's, a lot of people talk about it more like a, a, a work, um, an HR benefit. And then the distracted driving came by because in my travels, I was leaving London School Economics where I was doing a talk and a car almost ran me over and the guy was looking at his phone. I was in, I was in um, um, Ireland, in um, Belfast, Ireland, training some folks, and it was the same thing. I'm getting ready to cross the road, and it's a beautiful city, all rebuilt, of course, red brick everywhere, uh, a car on the phone. And then in San Diego, I got tapped by a car, and it was ugly. And I said, we just have to – we all know it's a problem. So the distracted driving came out of a place of just, I'm going to do something. I don't know what it's going to be, but I'm going to do something to be involved and try to solve this problem. So I think I've learned two things from what you said there, and I'm trying to distill a, a, a lot of stuff. First, number one, don't cross the street with Jerry. That's number one. Uh, yeah, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> That's number one. But gosh, there's so much here, right? And and, and where, where I'm kind of going with that is, you know, the, the question that usually comes up for me is why is something exist? And may, maybe give me a, I almost want to say, give me a little bit of history. I want to feel, I feel like 20 years ago, this wasn't even a topic to discuss, but now it is something that we have got to address. We've got to mm -hmm. think about it, something we've got to plan for. What? To give me a little bit of that history and that timeline. How have we gotten here to where workplace safety is so important? Uh, you know what? That's a great question. And what a lot of people don't realize, it's the value you put on your employees. People that aren't doing workplace safety, you just it's not saying you don't care about your employees. But when you're not talking about workplace safety, you're 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 um your employees are, I was actually just with the superintendent of Lumbar Schools a couple hours ago. I visited with him. They've also installed this Blue Point Alert system, and I want to see how it works for this, this whole school system. And he was telling me, he was saying, like, much like police officers have a fraternity, maybe if somebody works in different industries have a fraternity. Well, teachers have a fraternity, too. And when, before they started talking about safety, whether what school it was, they were all talking to each other about not feeling safe, feeling vulnerable, the doors were left unlocked. We're not talking about training and not in a scary way, but just having a, an open conversation about their fears and how to address them. The biggest difference is social media and uh, the prevalence of knowing what happened in Europe five minutes ago when it got alert on your phone, there's something bad happened. So in fact, um, if you go back, just if I'm, maybe at some point we'll talk about the phenomenon of active shooter versus mass killings and people talk about both. But I'll just give you one example. Of, I'm in Chicago right now and they had two recent shootings that were now on the national media. One is definitely gang related, so it wouldn't be active shooter. That doesn't count, uh, and uh, drugs don't count, and organized crime don't count. But I was at, I was reviewing the numbers, and so far this year they've had 294 murders in Chicago so far. They peaked up about uh, 21 murders more than last year, um, and they have they had 778 murders last year. So they're actually at a higher pace right now. But, but I found it interesting that um, different media outlets cover it different. The Chicago Tribune, if you're wondering, keeps a daily count and te tells what happened in the narrative of each one of the shootings. But they listed that 542 murders as of today. And, uh, then last, and then there's another media source that says it's 561. What's the difference? But you mean you're, you're telling me that you know 19 of those don't count as homicides? 
So it seems that, but there's always this delta between Center for Disease Control, the FBI, and media. So the prevalence of, of access to information is really the big change. And now almost everybody's talking about safety. And really for your viewers, when you're going back to work and during the COVID-19 and switching back to a live environment, you have a wonderful idea because people want to hear what you're doing to help them and say from a health perspective related to COVID or other uh, transmittable things that could happen. You know, any, um, any um, um, OSHA regulations you can find, wearing steel toe boots, those kind of things. You can institute this now, this really smart way to bring people back in the office and to set up the system around them. And that's what I do for companies, I'll, whether it's a driving program or a live program. I go in and start talking to the leadership team and saying, well, here's how we can implement the program. We can make your employees feel more valued. They can take these tools and when they're at their church or at a civic event or they're at a park or they're at a festival, they can deploy the same knowledge because you practice with them at work and they can take that to their families. It's really exciting time to be in this field because we can do training the right way, not the fear-based way a lot of people want to do it. So I'm, I'm going to pull a couple of points out and Shofu keeps showing up for me. Shofu, thanks for uh, showing up. I always uh, appreciate you uh, showing up. And I would encourage anybody else, if you're listening through, uh, I'm, I'm furiously jotting down stats and notes as uh, Jerry's talking to me here. So if you're, if you want Jerry to go back through it or actually see if I understood what he was saying, sure. challenge me and uh, type something in the comments. I'd, I'd, I'd love, to see, love to hear from you. But some of what I heard from you is, is really interesting because, you know, I just did a podcast about, uh, with a guy named Adam Seymour. He wrote a book, Beyond Feelings. And he talks about how feelings in the workplace really matter. And I'll be the first to admit, 20 years ago, if you had asked me about feelings, I was like, what a waste of time, right? I, I, I've changed. I've completely changed. How people feel in, in the workplace, their vulnerability, their security, their fear, mm -hmm. that really manifests itself in terms of how those people act in the organization. And what I'm hearing for you is this is now something that an organization cannot just say, all right, we're going to sweep that under the rug. That's not something. But look, if people are talking amongst themselves and they feel vulnerable, they feel scared about this stuff, and you haven't addressed it, it's kind of an elephant in the room, and you're just not touching it, right? And that's that's something that could drive them away from you because employee loyalty and retention is so important these days, yes. right? And this is a is this is another way to just give back and invest in your employees. That's kind of what I heard in a lot of that. You know, you know, you you're you're really just hitting a great point in the work environment that we live in right now. If you will go back to work and don't feel safe, you're looking for another job. You're not going to stay there, even if you you like the company. But if you don't feel safe, and it really doesn't have to be, we have to worry about an active shooter. In fact, uh, this Blue Point guys that I'm visiting with right now in Chicago the last couple of days, it's really the idea that we're going to help give you systems that can uh, that you can easily use and you can deploy around your campus or whatever you know, factory, what have you. In this case, uh, a private academy, a private high school. Um, you can you can deploy this and make it in a really smart way. It's not scary, you know, and, and everybody sees it. When you talk about your employees at the beginning of the year, your students, when you're doing your drills, when you work with the police department to practice this or EMS, we were just talking about a lumbar uh, school incident where a, stu a student, um, a student uh, went into a um, diabetic incident and they, they activated the system and 96 seconds later, an EMS person was standing there. Wow. 96 seconds. This is the superintendent of Lumbar School just, just told me. And so you, when you can see that, you everybody feels valued. The yeah. parents see it. The kids see it. The teachers see it. Their spouses see it. Because, you know, you think your teachers with this misinformation about how often an active shooter happens in the school, it's about 25 percent of the overall 100 percent of these incidents that get, um, get cataloged about 30 a year. But about, about 25% of those, a Nash, uh, going back to the past 20 years, are in schools, actually 24.6 to be exact, percent are in schools. But even then, there's so many other incidents that happen that have nothing to do with somebody trying to hurt you. But if you take the time to do something, and if you take the time to do it the right way and empower your employees that they can take charge and really uh, take, you know, be involved in an institute at an incident, at a medical incident, be that a, or some other kind of incident going on campus or wherever your building is, boy, how empowering is that? That you really put in their hands a tool that potentially could save somebody's life. So 
here, here's the thing that's kind of rattling around in my head. There's lots of things rattling around in my head. But uh, the, the one that's kind of coming to the front right now is I don't know that I fully understand the scope of what people should take a look at. I mean, so active shooter versus workplace violence. What, what, what do I need to be aware of? I guess, because I think that's part of my problem. I don't even, I don't even know what to pay attention to. <laughs> right. Can you, can you kind of break that down for me a little bit and help me understand that? I sure can. Um, a couple of things that, that come to mind. I want to talk about, let me define two words real quickly for you. Okay. We hear the term active shooter. That's when people, uh, the definition attempting to kill, let me see if I can get the camera right here, attempting to kill or kill in a confined space that's populated. Now, you would think that would be a universal definition between the FBI and Homeland Security. Well, it's not. The FBI says, well, it's not a confined space. What about an open field? Jonesboro, Arkansas shooting. The kids pulled a fire alarm in a school uh, outside of the, uh, the White House last August. There was a group of people outside the White House who got shot. Another that was an active shooter incident. So it really and another thing about active shooter, it can't be organized crime. It can't be gang related and it, it can't be drug related. So if any of those things happen, they don't define that as active shooter. What problem and with our media sources, who I think are trying to report the news, you know, if it bleeds, it leads kind of thing. We know that. But uh, but when they're trying to report it, they use these words interchangeably of mass killing and active shooter. The fact about that, the most common definition of mass killing is, is people that are killed for or more. So it could be any kind of incident, gang related. This, this party that happened in Chicago right now, the, the, they're not 100% sure why, if it, if it was gang related or not, or drug related. But four, eight people were shot and four people died. So it would be a mass killing. Now, will it be an active shooter event? We don't know because we need to know the origin of why it happened when they determine that. And the FBI, if you don't know, you can go to the website of the FBI and type, or you can just type in your Google search or whomever, however you do it. Um, um, FBI active shooter research, and they'll pull up the first studies from 2000, 2013, and they've refreshed the study each year. Well, in that study, and I'll just give you one example, people focus on active shooter, and I think that's a mistake. Number one, uh, uh, there's, there's a reason why. So in this first 13-year period, of 2014 year period, 2000, 2013, the, part, the first part of the study, and then they refreshed it with Texas State University, I think it's 684 people were killed in active shooter events. And people get a little squirrely on that because like, boy, that's a lot. It's very sad. I mean, it's unexcusable. It makes no sense why somebody want to kill somebody. They don't, it, there's no beef. There's no fight. It wasn't, you know, didn't, it just doesn't make sense to anybody. It doesn't make sense to me. And I've done a ton of research on it. But when you exchange that with uh, the number of people that died during that same 14 year period, it's 254,761 people were murdered in that same time period. So it gets 0.000182, I think is the number that I, did, I haven't done in a while. So it's something like that. So really, we ought to talk about a holistic look at workplace safety. So that's talking about your facility. It, it, we can do a facility assessment for you. And if, if it, whether it's, I did the water system as well as I, my last year with the town of Cary when I was on special assignment with, uh, with the manager's office. I, I went from the police department to there to do that last job. And during that time, you know, we did, we, we did the water system assessment, which now is required federal, federally with, a, with a, an engineering firm, with Dewberry Engineering, actually. Uh, but we did that for them, which was great. But we put in systems like, you know, how's your process of coming in? In other words, I go by the slogan, excellent security planning is excellent customer service. In other words, if somebody comes to your building, if they know where to go and they know where they're supposed to be and how you can move them around, say, think of a doctor's office. Generally, you can walk up to the receptions, check in, and you have to wait, and there's a door that's locked, and somebody comes out and gets you or calls for you, and you go back, and then you go in the room. Well, that process can be set up whether you're in a doctor's office, dentist office, or if you happen to be in some other kind of a building. How do you greet customers at a warehouse, for example? What's your signage like? And what's your lighting like? How do you use your cameras? And, and if anybody's watching, if you have a camera bay, wherever your reception office is, think of your child's school. Put a camera bank of the, all those cameras around your property, no matter what kind of business. That though, When you go to your kid's school and see those camera banks in the, in the, um, the principal's office, that's not for them. It's for you. They want to make sure you know we're watching. It's a subtle sign. Every school does it just about now in America. 
So but really the focus should be on the training and then we need to practice that training. And we need to tell people, we need to communicate to the employees, you did nothing wrong, but we have cameras out here. We're paying attention to the cameras. We're watching for people who belong or don't belong, who has an ID on, who doesn't, who has a scan card, who doesn't. How do we process visitors in and off site? Do you let your, your family come to a secure location, like for a lunch break behind a locked door? I wouldn't recommend that, but do you do that? So just helping people work through that process and then drills. Uh, three drills I love. But not the, I did. They're super easy to do. Where's an interior door that locks? Because I have a single case of an active shooter I researched that shot through a door, saved the Virginia Tech shooting. And he followed two kids in. They're one of his manifesto to kill, and he they got behind a locked door and barricaded. And he shot through the door. But he's the only one because most active shooters I've talked to or read about, they've actually said it's not. It's kind of like a fiduciary responsibility. They have so much bad stuff they want to do if they start shooting in doors they don't know about. But getting behind a locked door and using this great commercial grade construction there. They have polymer in the windows and they, so you, they won't break out and come in uh, if, it, if they got shot through, for example. I mean, you can use these systems to be in place, but it can be done in a way that we wanna make sure you guys know how to protect your friends and families because you're our most valuable asset. And when you come from an approach of creating a safety culture that makes the employee the most valuable asset you have, which is what it is, if you don't think so, then that's, that's a problem for that company. So we talked a little bit about active shooter. We talked about workplace safety, which is really the, the, the place that you need to start to spend some time looking at. Talk to me about, uh, I mean, there's the whole component in and around fleets. I mean, that's a whole nother area of consultation, kind of helping them change and shift uh, behavior. I mean, there's so many facets and I wanted to kind of try to see if mm -hmm. we can walk through each one of them. Talk to me about, talk to me about that. Well, as, as I think I told you before, I was born out of frustration just because I, I got hit by bumped by a car in San, San Diego. And it, but it was, you know, what we found, what I found with this, much like workplace violence training or workplace prevention, and I say it's empowering your employees for a safer environment. But in any event, um, when we start talking about safety culture, whether you have to file OSHA regulations, whether it's workplace violence prevention programming, empowering your employees in that way. When it comes to implementing programs like fleet safety, we have to start talking from the beginning. What are we trying to capture? So for an example, if I'm talking to a company, I'm talking about how we're gonna implement a program because uh, this most recent uh, HVAC company that I trained, their, their insurance company called them and said, you need to call to, they, they, they've seen my program with other clients of theirs and I've implemented with these guys. And now that when I did, when I started the implementation phase, it was interesting because they thought it was kind of gotcha policing. You know, in their case, the boss is looking because you drove your vehicle this way. You drove over 80 miles per hour because you have a GPS in there and that's what we censor it to. So what we need to do is tell them, you know, our insurance company called, said, use this consultant. And so how do we deliver it? And then we engage with it. We try to get with them to do a pledge not to distract a drive. And there's really six reasons that get you in big trouble uh, at driving. But one of them is like backing. Do you have a mandatory back in or pull through the space? Because in North, if you're watching this in North Carolina, you're at least at minimum a contributing factor when you're backing, if not at fault. And almost always, if you look at a rec report, on the one side, there's vehicle number one, and then the other side is vehicle number two. If you're in vehicle number one's base, in insurance language, that means you're at fault, probably, or more at fault than somebody else. But if the, if, with the companies in North Carolina that, did, when I, that I help, when I just tell them that alone, they just stop a lot of their wrecks. It's about 70% of these guys have some kind of backing wreck. One guy was telling me about that. I was helping one company I helped. They had a guy back into a $4,000 garage door, custom garage door. He put a ladder right through the door, but he was backing in when he was trying to leave the He was actually turning around his car and back, backed into the garage door and destroyed it. So it was, um, so if we can stop backing in. And the other one is, is how do you talk about fleet safety? Part of that's where you're going. So in other words, you allow a wrapped vehicle with your logo to go to the ABC store. I don't care if you drink or not, it's not my business, but do you want your, is that the logo you want, you want your logo or when you're going in, are you having a logo shirt on when you're, when you're maybe going to a place that most of would agree or it's an adult establishment of some form, or you're, you're going to the ABC store or, the, or you're going into a bar and you're, you got a logo shirt on. Is that really the company representation you want? And are you, if you allow your employees to drive their vehicle home, Okay, how's it being maintenance? Because if you don't know the maintenance record, so if you're not tracking how quickly you replace tires, your, your car will tell you if somebody's aggressively driving by braking aggressively, aggressive acceleration, how quick you turn the tires. So maybe they should they should have some artificial intelligence on their fleet view that can read all that out, right? What do you think, Vinay? I think that's a fantastic idea. <laughs> I think it's, it's probably know you. Uh, 
But when you put all this together and you give them a turnkey program, the win about it is, is we let these employees, they get involved, they take partnership, and they can really save some good money on their insurance. And more importantly, they feel like they're part of the solution. And at least with personal safety at work, I allow any of the kids from any of the employees. So every company I've given, I've you know, people have purchased this turnkey program, all their 15 to 21 year olds can take the course for free. And if you're in like a company like Liberty Mutual is your insurance agent, you get a five or seven percent discount on your insurance. Think about that for a teen driver. That's a lot of money. Yeah. Wow. So I, I want to uh, kind of review back because we've we've I, I've just been jotting down notes here as we're, we're, we've been talking, and and I mean I think there's threads here that I want to pull on. Sure. Um, so I always think in terms of these blind spots, right? Some of the things that uh, first one I heard was safety culture actually saves money, and the reason why is because I mean if I kind of jump ahead here. Um, safety is not about gotcha policing and safety is, is, is a security is not, should not be an afterthought. It should be a forethought, right? You should think about it beforehand. Mm -hmm. And if you really do plan for it the right way, it can save you money because first of all, employees aren't leaving because they feel safe and secure and they won't look somewhere else. I feel mm -hmm. secure here, but then also then they see it as a potential invest in, investment in them. You are investing in them. Uh, and, and they'll feel that. So you improve, improve me or employee morale. You save them from walking out the door. You get them to endear them to you. So th there's just a lot there. I, I heard about um, this idea. If the culture in the company, people are talking amongst themselves, that's something you just want to, you know, those negative sentiments, you want to get them out, get them, get them out and get them into the open and, and dispel them. And here's an opportunity to do that. We, uh, we also talk about this idea of active shooter and the multiple definitions there versus mass killings. And the idea that work, uh, you should really focus on workplace safety and not the active shooter. Gosh. It sort of should be part of the, the conversation, but it's, it should be, I give about five minutes to active shooter and 55 minutes for the hour program for everything else. So, gosh, there, there, Part, part of the challenge with what you do is educating people as to what they need to be aware of, right? They, mm -hmm. they, they, I mean, if they're anything like me, probably dumber than a rock, they don't necessarily know where to start, right? So where does someone start with this? I mean, so someone calls you up. I don't know that they even, they, they just, lots of times things would just start with this, something in your gut, and you're like, I, 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 know, I know I need to do something. I don't know what to do. When someone's calling you up for the first time, Jerry, they don't know what to ask you because they don't I and mean, they don't see it. They don't know what called. How does that conversation go? What are the where are the, what are they looking for? What are they trying to solve as a problem? You know, uh, this is this is really just a. I'm so glad you asked that question. A lot of people I've I've heard the phrase "you don't know what you don't know," and what a lot of people think. I get this all the time. They think, um, you know, that employee safety training uh, facility, which I throw in the facility assessment, you don't need the Homeland Security version of my training. That uh, We've got a grant for $30,000 and train a bunch of people in the town of Cary, uh, 10 of us on how to do this, the, the Homeland Security version of like, you know, a water plant or a stadium or what have you. But doing, looking at your facility and coming in with some practical skills, it, usually it's only $1,002 if I'm going in. The most expensive uh, place a guy had a, um, um, at a pharmaceutical plant in New London, Connecticut called Sheffield Pharmaceutical, he had an automated, only one door wasn't automated on a roll down system. Uh, and it cost him 12000 to fix that door. But otherwise, it was a couple thousand dollars on some changes they did. And, and their employees just really appreciate that kind of thing. So the starting place is having the conversation. Like, what are your concerns? Let's validate some of those. And when you come with active shooter, I usually come with the data, something like this. On the last 20 years, on average, we've averaged 22.5 active shooter events a, a year. They've ticked up. I think there's more of a of awareness because we populate the data. It's in news reports, that kind of thing. But the other one is it might be a little bit more frequent. But the other data number I use is 27. That's the average number of the last 10 years of lottery winners of the jackpot lottery. <laughs> I'm not making fun of an active shooter. Please don't hear that. But I'm just saying, if you want a scalability, because to win the lottery, uh, at least the Powerball, you're two, uh, 292 million to one. I think it's the last I read when I did the research initially. When I look back at these numbers, so that's if me and you had a ticket together, that'd be two people. If I won or you won it by yourself, that'd be four people. So, you know, it's like, so we go, we do that math, but it's 27. Nobody buys a lottery ticket and quits work. I just well, don't. Well, so, so I think we need to give the. 
So let me distill that. Basically, what you're saying is you could buy a lottery ticket for every day for the rest of your life, and you probably have a better chance of doing that than getting into an active shooter situation. Yeah, when they happen, they're terrible, right? I, yeah, right. I, I, there's an yeah, insurance absolutely. manager at a major insurance company that I'm doing some work with. He's paid out two of these incidents, one for $6 million and one a part of $28 million for an active shooter incident. You have to think Sandy Hook High School, uh, Elementary School alone, well, Sandy Hook happened. Uh, they tore down the school and rebuilt it for a tune of $19 million, I believe. That's the most expensive non-payout uh, for insurance in active shooter history. The other one is, is that people think about active shooter, like with my clients in, in China, I'm just communicating with the, the school. There's a person that brings me over for their school, uh, seven of their schools there. And I'll, I'll share this article two hours before the, uh, the Sandy Hook shooting. They had a, a person go into a, a elementary school in China and stab eight, uh, seven, 27 students and one adult two hours before the Sandy Hook shooting. And now there's a, they're, they're on the rise significantly for mallets, um, um, knives, and machete attacks in schools. So I'm communicating with that person that owns the schools, these private schools, that's explain, hey, if you're not having me come back and talk about it, at least have this conversation when you have some way to fend off the people who are bring in a knife. So it's a, it's just an ongoing to topic about how we can live safer lives. Really, that's the starting point. But once we start that conversation, we just have to be reasonable. I mean, no one wants to put a 70-foot fence, well, you may want to, but you shouldn't, a metal fence around there and you know hire 400 armed guards to stand by each classroom. There's some really practical things we can do. And when the more awareness, more visibility, and more conversation about, you know, what's a threat? Where's the threat? What are your general action steps? How are you going to respond physiologically? Because that fear base, most people say we were so scared, we froze with fear. It was called the startle effect. But if we talk about that, we can mitigate that. We're talking about how you trust your instinct. I strongly recommend the book Gift of Fear by Gavin DeBecker, Gift of Fear. It's an excellent resource to talk about fear. And in the middle, there's four studies to talk about. If somebody says, trust me, or I promise, and they just met you, somebody, they met a girl at a bar kind of thing, which young girls that are dating, this is really good. I think this is really good for them to trust their instinct. Something's wrong, because it probably is. If there's something up. And then finally, how to use the facility. If you knew that the glass had two sheets of polymer in it, so if it broke, it wasn't going to fly into this principal's office that I'm in right now, or if the concrete walls or the, um, the metal veneer of a building now, because you really can't buy a commercial, you can't build it because building code pretty much requires some stone, some face, some brick face, some metal or some glass. That's generally what things are built on. So it's really a great chance for us to take a really sensible look, some really simple uh, action steps, and then practice those with drills. Uh, three drills I, I really believe in, where can you shelter in place? In other words, where can you lock the door and get behind it? I talked about shooting through a door earlier. Do you know how to lock down your facility, close the dealership, uh, auto dealership's front door? Uh, do you know how to, uh, and then where would you go to an alternate place? Much like the school I'm sitting in right now, they have sister schools. We had it in Cary, North Carolina, Davis Drive Middle School and Cary, Green Oak High School were sister schools. So if something happened to one of the campuses, all the parents and those kids would be shuttled to the other school. So why don't you do that in your own business and then really meet one of your neighboring businesses and that might help you in your business or if nothing else, create a culture of safety in your area where your building is because you let everybody know what's going on. It's really easy things to do that I've thought about and I've worked with other companies on so I can help those companies make those decisions without having to have a lot of fanfare about, I don't really know what to do or where to start. Let me tell you how to start. So, and, and I think it to me, what kind of comes out as I'm listening to all this uh, is that you know police officers don't get into into person-on-person uh, -person crimes very often, and the stat that you told me is eighty-three percent of those police officers don't know why they're not victims of crime. So clearly, it is something just about the way you behave, about the way you think, about the way you interact with the world and perceive things that are happening around you. So it doesn't mean that you need to be walking around in a bubble. It doesn't mean that you need to be walking around with an AR. Uh, AR-15 in your, or strapped on your shoulder or something like that, right? It, it's just the way you walk into the world and you're prepared for it before it happens. And that's it. I mean, it's just a practice and it's a behavior that you get into. And that's, that. it seems like to me, that's almost a starting point. Just by investing in that, you just give some preparedness mm -hmm. for yourself. And that's just a gigantic step forward in and of itself is kind of what I'm hearing. Right. Can I give you an example? I, I use this. I'll, I use this bit when I'm speaking on stage. It's I'm much more theatrical. Then I'll 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 dial it down a little bit. 
A few months back, my wife and I were, I was heading to this, we have a Staples and a Trader Joe's uh, in, near, near our home in Cary, North Carolina. So I'm heading to the store to get to, to Staples to get some, uh, some office supplies. And my wife said, hey, can I ride with you? I'm going to go to Trader Joe's. Absolutely. I get my stuff. I walk out. And in front of Trader Joe's, there's this kid running around, cutest kid you've ever seen in your life. And a guy about seven foot tall with a loaf of bread. And he basically was doing this. He, everybody came out. He would lunge at him with the bread. And my wife's like, can we go to Trader Joe's? I'm like, no. <laughs> do you look and see what that guy's doing? Now, he didn't do anything at the time. He wasn't doing anything to hurt anybody. And I make a good bit and try to make it funny on the stage. But the reality of it was there was something wrong there. And what police officers pick up on pretty good, pretty quickly, is the behavior. Like, if, say, if you're just think about how many times you think somebody's kind of following you. You speed up, they speed up. You slow down, they slow down. Or somebody's on their phone and they're walking real, they're not saying anything and they're looking at you or they're looking at other people. You know, if something just doesn't look right. And when you have that, but I, that's the, that's when something looks out of place, it, 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 it may be nothing. It may be innocuous. The guy may have lost a bet and said he had to stay in front of Trader Joe's. Now, of course, I got in my car and called my fellow carry police officers. I was retired at that time, but I called my police. Hey, you might want to check on this guy with a loaf of bread at Trader Joe's. And nobody had called them yet, which is kind of funny to me. People walked in and out and thought it was nothing. But when, but when, this, when it seems out of place, that's the starting point. It doesn't have to be super scary. And that's where we can help our employees really find a reasonable approach to things that are out of sort. And then again, if you know the action steps, I have 17 years of research in this list of action steps. I started with um, with active shooter training and the police officers and how to respond, what to do, what we tell our uh, school teachers or what we would tell our, uh, you know, the businesses we did. We did, uh, I did a training at Lenovo uh, in Morrisville, North Carolina uh, to at building number eight, if you guys are watching and work there. Um, and then, you know, we, we showed them the action steps and they start, started employing those action steps. But once you know what to do, you're empowered. That's just power to know what to do next if something bad happens. So, Jerry, why this is resonating so much with me is, look, as a company that studies data, we go to companies all the time and say, hey, look, those suspicions that you have as a business leader, things that you think are happening, the stories that you think are happening in your business, I can help you figure out if that's true or not. Because lots of times if a business owner or a leader in a company or even an individual a technician employee feels like something happened, it's, there's probably a good chance that you I'll call it the spidey sense. The spidey sense is going on, on alert, right? And it, it's the same message that I'm saying, right? We go to these owners and say, hey, you, got think, you think something's happening in your business. Let's find out if it's actually true, but let's go find the data to do it. You're saying the same thing, right? The data proves out that if there's a likelihood that you believe something's happening, it's probably, <laughs> there's a likelihood that it's at least worth investigating to see if it's worth your time or not, right? And I, I think that's exactly what I'm hearing from you. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, I, I would just think you apply this to your everyday life. Let's say you have a, a, a disagreement with a friend of yours, maybe your spouse, one of your kids. Uh, my parents were trust but verify. <laughs> so that's how I was raised. Um, but when, you're, um, when you think you have a hunch that you have a, something didn't go right, a conversation, maybe they said something out of the way and bothered you. You can use those same senses or hunch that something's wrong and do the same thing with what's in your environment. And if your environment doesn't feel safe or something's out of place, it's pretty easy to listen to that. Where we get into the problem is, you you know these people are kind of like John Wayne, they're never scared of anything. And you have other people it's like the sky is falling, you know, and it's just the littlest thing. Or maybe you go into Starbucks with those person one day, like, I'll have a, uh, and they were straining to get it. I think it's awesome because if your biggest problem is ordering Starbucks, you have a pretty good life. <laughs> but uh, but it's this idea that you get signals, something's going wrong. Just use those signals that you use in everyday life to protect your family, to, to protect yourself, and take those additional steps. If you either go on my website and watch some videos, it's personalsafetyatwork.com. There's some, there's six videos on there you can watch. I publish them. They're part of my e-learning to make it seem more live. But I've one on there talking about this theory about what police officers know. I've got one on there for notification. One time I used it for a tornado that had, was coming towards my house when I lived in Raleigh. Uh, one on, you know, a couple, they're just telling these stories. What would you do if a road rage incident came to you uh, at a, um, at a gas station, I had I talked about it the next day. I talked about it at a Y the next day. One of the people in the presentation had this very thing happen, so I recorded a bit on that. But we can just take some simple steps. And if you take just a little step, you don't have to hire somebody if you don't want to. Just 
take some of the things I'm telling you today and just apply them. But if you have a small business of five employees, it's really easy to have a conversation. And when you start talking about safety, they're going to come up with some fear ideas. Listen to the fear ideas. And that really is going to, when your employees heard about that fear idea, you were saying earlier in this, in this broadcast, when they start hearing that, you allow them to talk about that, it exposes some of the either fallacies to what's going on, some misrepresentation or some of the things maybe management or leadership has talked about. And then whenever you're helping that employee understand what the culture idea, you go back to safety culture, we want to live in a safety world. We want you to feel safe at work. Here's all the things we're doing for that. And it doesn't take that much. It hardly takes any money. It just takes you taking the time to care enough to have the conversation because they're having it either way you're having it or not. Whether you're having it or not, it doesn't matter. They're having that conversation. So uh, what I hear, heard here is, uh, you know, the, uh, and I love the title of this, a couple of things that I jotted down here, right? Is this, uh, I think it said Gavin DeBecker's name for Gift of Fear. Is that what, that was, what it was called? That sounds interesting. Yeah, you know, there's there's lots of evidence about why the brain does what it does. And when, when sort of that spidey sense, the amygdala starts firing, right? Saying mm -hmm. something here, it, it's, it's an opportunity to see because the other thing here is suspicions usually use suspicions. Usually is that fear, right? Mm -hmm. If you have that fear kind of in the spidey sense going, going nuts there. Uh, there's usually some truth to it. Believe, trust your gut and inspect. It doesn't mean it's a hundred percent, right? Right. But there's probably something there, right? There's a thread, and I think that's what I'm hearing here. It, which is which is funny because that's exactly the same sort of message I've got. Look, if you suspect something's happening in your business, it's probably true, right? Use it in your personal sense, in your personal life as well, right? Well, you know, I'd like to just kind of, if you want some perspective on this, yeah, you're you're built this. We're all built this way. If you go, if you believe anything about Freud, and he talks about this thing called id. Mm -hmm. The core and uh, Gavin Becker talks about it as well. I did a little bit of research, but Gavin Becker is the worldwide expert on it. So you absolutely want to have. Uh, by the way, on the book, uh, mature sixteen-year-olds. My wife and I give it to uh, our friends and our family member, our nieces and nephews that turned eighteen. Certainly, the girls that are more mature. There are some. Uh, they talk about some topics in there that maybe would make some people uncomfortable. The real life, it's issues. Uh, and they live to tell about it, but there's there's still mature content there. In any event, but the concept is he talk he talks about what Freud talks about as well, and it's your id. The very core id is safety. Our core of our being talks about safety. So when you don't feel safe, there's a reason you don't feel safe. Some people would say they make themselves feel vulnerable, and that vulnerability in a in an unfamiliar situation. I'd be a little more cautious than I would with when I'm talking to you because I know we know each other. We, we talk business all the time. We've had lunch and coffee, so we, we know each other pretty well. We talk about each other's family, so we know it. But when I'm talking to somebody I just met, it's not time to be vulnerable then. It just isn't. And when you think something's wrong, you go back to what you just said. When you think something wrong and you don't listen to it, you're not listening to your core of who you are. Now, if you're always scared, that's a problem. You're never scared, it's a problem. But at least being aware of that, that rising up, that something's wrong, um, you can just attribute to that. And really, because once you get your place, your, your, yourself in this really unsafe place, then the fear kicks in. That fear that goes back to that, what I said, that startle effect. You have auditory exclusion. Your, uh, your, your vision or your memory kind of starts lapsing as you really remember the focus. Your vision goes three degrees. Your heart rate increases. You lose finger dexterity. And all of those things lead to your, your, um, a fear response. And we train and inoculate first responders, police. You know, firemen have to go with a blindfold into a burning building and find some widget that's supposed to be a, a lost person. I don't want to do that. It's not in my wheelhouse. But there's, we have some really brave men and women that are firefighters that have to train that as well. A lot of other first responders do the same thing. But when we're having this conversation where you and I may not be trained in that, we can just at least be aware that that's going to start welling up. When, when it starts to well up, you there is something going on. Just it's how you respond to it and that controlled nature. How you can, it's really important just to recognize the, 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 it's starting to percolate. And then when you see percolation, you might want to pay attention. So... I want to make a connection here, right? Uh, you know, there's terminology and language that I use in ways that I think about things, right? When people say they go by gut feel, I mean, that's, I mean, fear is a is a gut feel, right? So that suspicion, that fear. So I, I, again, just to kind of connect the dots, at least in my head, if if you walk into a situation and you say, you know, it's, it's a little too dark in this alley, I, I, just, I just don't think I should there's probably some truth to it, <laughs> right? Maybe you should think twice about that. Uh, 
I, I don't know. Uh, I was raised with a pretty violent man for part of my life. Uh, we'll just leave it at that for this. I don't know who's on the call here, but um, when he had a temper, he hit. And my mom was living with this guy. So essentially we were living with this guy. Uh, it was after my, my mom and father, my mother and father uh, divorced. She was with this guy. And I knew when, when this guy got upset, I knew not to be near him. So it, it didn't take long for me as a seven, eight, eight, you know, six, seven, eight year old kid to go, okay, that guy's getting ready to hit somebody uh, and I'm going to get away from him. So I learned, and those clues that we see, maybe you didn't have that experience. So I developed that a little sooner. But, it, but it's just pain. It's really is there something your body will tell you something's wrong. Well, we're, and the reason we get so much value out of our, our employees receive so much value when employers take the time to have a, 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 a safety culture, to take the time to have somebody come in and talk about employee safety, put in practical solutions, not big metal gates, but do simple things to employ, you know, make your environment more safe, workplace practices, distracted driver program, tracking the way you use um, when you're, you know, like you and I've talked several times, when you have excessive brake use, there's really no one reason that happens because you're excessive braking. So if we don't talk to the employees about that, we don't watch that, that, you know, the, the, the wheel come in closer and closer and closer. Because once you've been there six or eight months, the vehicle should be driven more responsibly. You don't allow an a, a, idling. You don't allow excessive of idling because you don't want or leave the car on because it's cold. So it'll be cold when you come back from lunch break. No, you wasted a bunch of gas. It wasn't good for our economy. It does, it's not a good look for your company that's wrapped. A vehicle that's wrapped idling and with nobody in it doesn't make any sense. So we take those steps. Um, somebody's back behind me on those. <laughs> Hello, surprise. Um, so, um, yeah, so when you don't have that conversation, you're almost saying it's okay. Or you're saying it's okay not to feel safe at work. It's okay not to take this time to, to engage me and find out how I feel about my safety at work. Or when I leave at night, how do I, how do I leave the building? How, where's my parking deck? Or where do I park my car relative to where my office is? And a lot of this work from home stuff has really been great because, you know, burglaries are down because everybody's home. So, but now this, we're starting to go back to work and these companies are opening up and we're going out more frequently. I mean, previously, pretty much your grocery store or your pharmacy was about the only place you could, you can get attacked because you're, no one went out to anything else during the pandemic. But as we open back up, it's just as a really nice job, time to take a look at your company and see where you are. Maybe talk to your employees about it and then find not somebody that's scary. Find, don't, if you don't want to use me, that's okay. But use somebody that's empowered your employees to feel better with facts, not fears, not, not uh, talking about. If you're only talking about active shooter, what a waste because you have all this myriad of other things that could go wrong. Actually, everywhere I speak, I, I, I have a crime map. And I put a crime map up, usually midway during the presentation. How'd you like dinner last night? I say to the audience, I have a speaker ball and I'll throw it into the audience. It's, it's actually a cube. But anyway, I'll throw it into the audience. About up to 2,000, it works. People, I throw it in and then they'll answer. Like, Where'd you go to eat? Where'd you go to eat? And they're talking about it. Who'd you take with you? Great. Did you know there's a homicide right there? <laughs> it was right around the corner. It was Lucas Oil State. I was in Indianapolis on this call. They had 2,051 crimes in the last year. If you've been to, uh, to Indianapolis, it's a really... I mean, super safe looking place. You wouldn't think it'd be too that. They had 108, 138 armed robberies that year. And it, you know, they, it, I had 454 assaults. I don't want to be around that. <laughs> Two homicides next to Lucas Oil Stadium. I don't you know, know so, not, but <laughs> some, something that's that's coming up for me as you're talking about some of this stuff is that you know if you want to deal with something, the first thing you got to do is you got to be aware of it. Number one, right? You got to yep. got to recognize that it is. Then you got to start to what I call engage with it. You got to start to say, all right, now now that I know it's there, it exists. What am I going to do about it? Right? Do I really care? Yes. And the last one is, all right, now that I care or I've decided to care, what am I going to do about it? And that's kind of that planning piece, right? So I'm thinking, if I'm the employee of a company and my boss comes in, I see my boss comes in and says, hey, we're doing some some training around this. I go and see something that happens. I see some of these stats. I see what's happening, and and you think to yourself. Yeah, I, I got this, <laughs> right? It's just that 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 nothing's done because I know that this is a possibility. We've talked about it internally in terms of what can be done, and we put some plans in place. And sure, we did the training at at, uh, at the office, but I just saw something on the news. I heard about something through yeah. social media, or whatever else. Hey, family, let's let's just sit down for a few minutes. I learned something today or last week, and, and I don't want to just talk about this for five minutes. If something happens, kids, here's where I want you to go. And that's it, right? Run, run, run through the backyard to the to the neighbor's house. 
I've already told them you're going to be coming if it's three o'clock in the morning and that, and that's it. But now you've got that peace of mind because you just put a plan in place. That's it. And that's, that's basically what you do, right? I tell you what, you can do one better. I did this with, um, I'm not sure I should say their name, a, a international company. And, um, but I, this is the first time I ever did them. I allowed them, they bought the e-learning, allowed them to film me since they did. But we, in the contract, I gave it to all their families. So every family member got to take the course that I gave them live and on e-learning. And what, what, the, what the number one, the feedback their HR got was, or excuse me, the risk manager's office, was completely, I, I didn't see it coming. I just thought it was a nice thing to do. It was kind of an alter, altruistic thing to do. I thought, you know, well, let's, because I because when I'm doing a training, I allow them, they can't give it, they can't sell it, my access step, because it's my research. But I, in my agreement with the company, I allow them to give it to any civic organization. In other words, if they have a, you know, if they if they have a gym they go to, or if they have a, you know, a, some kind of religious thing they do, or they have some place they hang out with their friends, it's a, you know, country. But wherever they spend their time, they're allowed to give my action steps and talk about what it is. And I'll do a phone call if they want me to walk them through a step, you know, help them set up a program over the phone. Because what we want to do is we want to get we want to take these employees and empower their families. Because once you get the family unit, because what's the biggest fear? Your kids. We talked about your children before. Go having your kids go off to college. I just had so. I literally had this conversation with um, um, a, a leader in one of the school systems here this morning. Like, what's your biggest fear? My daughter going to college in New York next year. So you know, we we set him up with a course. He's going to take his daughter's going to take the employee safety online training. I have a learning management system now, so I can just. I can deliver it to him so his daughter can take it before she leaves. And we have a distracted driver and do the same thing. But the, the idea, though, is that you can do something. And that something can be this planned effort. It doesn't have, again, it doesn't be a giant thing. But like you just said, hey, guys, come together, family meeting. Let's talk about how we do this. Like, And there's one of my videos on my website uh, where it, it's, I, I used a, it was a tornado. Hey, wife, kids, dog. I actually say, don't ask what order. Wife, kids, dog. Get let's get in a, let's go get in a closet here and take the vacuum out. Family in, wait for the thing to pass. But we, you know, my family hadn't. You know, I they my wife knows what I do, but we haven't really done a drill. And that made me just think. To your very point, now I actually, that's one of the reasons I give it away to their families because I want I don't want this just to be because it's probably not going to be at work. It's probably going to be at a gas station or you're out at a restaurant. Somebody's over there kind of having a, you know, when you can have a disagreement with maybe somebody you love and everybody else knows it maybe looks polite enough, but you can tell mm, something's up over there. So, but we want to help those people, the family members, we want to help their family. And if we, and you, as a corporation, if you can empower your employees, families to live safer, that's a home run. And if you don't think it, I can show you many uh, comments and emails I get uh, one was uh, I was working at Cattle Farmer Solutions uh, and I was training and this woman said she's pretty demure. She's quiet. And her husband's used to he kind of calls the shots and she grabbed his arm because he she she saw a brewing domestic and she came back and told Cattle at uh, you know, that time the one in uh, Morrisville location. He came back and said, let me tell you what happened after that training we had with Jerry. And so but because it was a sensible approach to notice something's out of place and at minimum, remove yourself from that thing that may or may not be going wrong. But you're not sure, and it was—it's just a really neat way to empower their family. It was really—it's I—I get a lot out of it. You can probably tell I get pretty jazzed up about it because how does it feel to make somebody feel and actually be safer? It's a cool thing to me. Yeah. Well, Jerry, I—I got to tell you, I—I I took uh, and I'm—I've been scribbling fast. I, I took a, a lot of notes here, and um, uh, you know, for anybody who's listening in, if you're hopefully you're just listening and, and not jotting notes because you're listening to what Jerry was, how much he's been educating us. Uh, I'm going to put the show, my show notes and my sort of my learnings uh, from this together. And I'll probably be pushing it out uh, tomorrow. So you, you expect probably tomorrow that you'll you'll see some of my notes here and, and obviously a link back to the video. Um Gosh, uh, you know, I, I try to write down what I think are the blind spots, and I've actually got ten of them that I uh, that I, I wrote down here. So quite quite a few of them. Uh, not I was to wonder what I could get you up to. I was trying to I was trying to get you to the higher level. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I think I think you did pretty damn good here. Um, I don't think you're if, if you don't usually watch this podcast. Uh, and I is great about catching the high points, and I I don't remember. I think it was Mike Code Wise. From one digital. If you guys don't know my code wise from one digital, he's just an amazing person. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, he's getting ready to have a baby. I don't know if it's coming yet or not. This, is, but it's coming in June. Uh, should be around now. Yeah. Uh, haven't heard anything yet. But um, 
I think Mike's the highest I've heard you say. Yeah. Mike at a time. He got to twelve, I think. <laughs> <laughs> it was a little bit. I'm gonna. I'm gonna have to. I have, I have to send him a text in just a minute. <laughs> yeah, uh, that that that's a good idea. So, and and Sherwood, hey, hey, thanks for uh, for uh, chiming in. He said very informative. Thank you guys. Alertness. Yeah, I I think that is uh, that is the the that is the word. The sum. If if I could summarize Jerry in one word, I think that's probably it. And that's probably a difficult thing to do is summarize Jerry in one word. <laughs> can, I, can I add one to that? And, and yeah. thank you for that comment because that really the number one people when I, I first get introduced to a new client, they say, oh, just be aware of your surroundings. Well, sort of. And alert, but being alert is different than being aware. That's paying attention to what's going on in your surroundings. Yeah. It's not being like, I got to be super vigilant, my head's on a swivel, but it's more like, that doesn't look right. I probably need to do something. So uh, thank you very much for that, Sherwood. That's, that's so, perfect. Sherwood, I, I actually, I think I'm going to start a new practice here. I, I, I'm going to think on this, but I like this idea. You know, I would love to kind of start to tell people as guests. So if you could leave someone with a sentence or a word, what is it? How would you wrap up? What you? What is the take home message? And I, I think, I think Sherwood, you just, uh, you, you gave me the, the idea, and I think this is what we're gonna do. This is the take home message. Alertness is what I get from what of all, all Jerry said here, and all the notes mm -hmm. I got. Alertness, I think, is the, is the take home message. Hey, John, um, I would say just trust your. If you think something's wrong, listen to your instincts. If you think something's up, it probably is. Listen to your instincts. Gosh. Uh, I'm, what, no, no truer words have been said, right? <laughs> um, Jerry, uh, well, first of all, Shofu and Sherwood and all those who've been listening on all the three different platforms that we're uh, kind of pushing this out live. Thanks for taking some time and for listening to Jerry. Hopefully you got as much, if not more, than what I got out of this. I, and I definitely got a page and a half of notes. So uh, I hope you got some value out of it. So thanks for being part of this. Uh, Jerry, as always, gosh, I... I always have to, it takes me like 24 hours to process through all the stuff that you tell me. <laughs> I always learn so much every time you and I chat. It's uh, mutual beneficial. Mutual yeah. beneficial. Well, well, thank you. You're, you're, you're very kind. Um, thanks. Thanks for the time, Jerry. My pleasure.